My guest today is one of the top B2B sales coaches in the world, helping his clients experience insane results and additional 50K to 100K per year in take-home pay through high-performance training. He's been in the sales game for over 14 years, was promoted 10 times in 10 years, has been the top 10 percentile every single year he's been in sales with notable stints at two Fortune 500 companies and the insane accomplishment of delivering nine figures a year in new business sales contracts. He's the president and founder of Venley Consulting, introducing Mark. Chan. Marcus, welcome to Winning Streaks. Hey, I'm excited to be here. You give me a huge head. I'm just a regular guy who failed a lot, but I'm really excited to come here and hopefully share with some lessons that can help people out there listening today. Oh, I'm very excited. And I'm a huge fan of your content on LinkedIn as, you know, a, a sales professional myself. It always gives me that additional boost that I need to, you know, get through the day. So really appreciate that, obviously. So how I want to start off is really going back to your origins. You know, your career started out as a chef at Oriental Village Rest Restaurant. Right. I believe this is your family restaurant at the time. You got it. Yep. And as in your words, at that time, you were an awkward, introverted Asian kid. How did your origin story shape who you are today as now a confident, confident energetic, inspiring entrepreneur? Yeah, so I appreciate that. So, um, you know, I definitely grew up way more introverted. And the thing is, is growing up, I actually didn't start speaking English till I was four years old, or even English or speaking at all at all till I was four years old. When I started speaking English, uh, I actually had a major speech impediment. So I struggled speaking, I went through speech therapy for years. And that only compounded just my insecurity and lack of confidence. So growing up as a kid, you know, I, I didn't really want to to talk too much. I kept to myself. I only had a few friends. I wasn't really popular. And that's just kind of how I grew up. And what was interesting is, you know, I think about when I think about building confidence, when I think of confidence, confidence is like a bank account. It requires like daily consistent deposits. And I believe early on those little deposits of, you know, speech therapy really, really did help. It actually, over time, one of the things that actually forced me to get out of my comfort zone, and you're going to think this is so silly, were just little events in my life that caused me to, to, to have to step up to the plate, if you will. Mm -hmm. and I'll give you an example. So I remember being uh, 11, 12 years old, and you're going to laugh, but I got really into street magic. Like David Blaine, like pull, like pull out coins and, and cards and just show people <laughs> magic tricks. Honestly, that was, I was like super into it's, it's super nerdy. I know. I know. I know. That's awesome. I think, I, I think it's great. I used to watch David Blaine all the time as a kid <laughs> on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, so I'm like, I, I love, I just loved his confidence, the way he carried himself. And to me, I'm like, how can I ever do that? So, you know, one of the things, if you want to get good at anything, you have to start practicing. So I actually went to the library like, every single week and I'll get books on magic and sleight of hand. And then I would practice nonstop in front of a mirror or on my dad's JVC camcorder over and over and over. And a lot of times with whatever you're doing, this trick, whatever, there's always what they call patter. So like a storyline, something, and you need to bring in an audience, engage them into, as part of the story. So that was really completely out of my comfort zone. So I start, I didn't immediately start presenting to people. I first started with my friends. So, you know, pull my friends, hey, I'm, I'm kind of like, like, I'm kind of magic right now. Can I show you magic trick? Yeah, okay, cool. I mean, it sounds funny. You know, me and my nerds, you know, nerdy friends. So I would do it. And they're like, oh, it's really cool. And what would naturally happen is, you know, at school, sometimes they would say, hey, you should do that. Do that thing you show me with that, that, that deck of cards. You know, do that thing where you stick the pen to the dollar. Do that thing where you do this. So I would do it. And as I started to do it, I started gathering crowds of students and kids. So here I'm 11, 12, 12 years old, completely out of my comfort zone. And now before I know, I have crowds of students watch before magic. I'm like, like almost on stage, but I'm just in the hallway, right? Mm -hmm. And that was like an, an example of just kind of building my confidence. But I was still pretty insecure at that point. And doing that definitely helped. And then over time, doing things that just pushed me completely out of my comfort zone. Like, like learning how to do things that were going to be hard. So if it was at my parents' restaurant, asking for tips, right? If it was like, I remember uh, being 14 years old and I'm a freshman now in high school and we're trying to recruit people to our swim team. I was competitive swimming growing up and we couldn't get people to, to go. And one of the seniors said, hey, we should all come out to the, to the pep rally and we should strip down this, our Speedos and swim gear and do a, a synchronized dance. I'm like, what? Wow. And so I would do it. And before I knew it, like I was leading these charges and like recruiting people to our, our, our swims, our swim meets, 
So I share some of these things with you because it wasn't like one overnight thing. It was these little events of compound over time. And I was still really, really insecure about it. But the more I did it, the more comfortable I got with being uncomfortable. And that helped me lean outside my comfort zone. Now, I've taken tests. And uh, as the last personality test I've taken, I'm now a tested ambivert. So meaning I fall right in the middle. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so I'm not extroverted. I'm not introvert. I'm right in the middle. So I can turn up when I need to, but also I, I need my time by myself. And I, I really found that out, especially once I actually got into B2B sales in 2007 and having to do outbound calls, you know, cold emails, walking door to door by foot, got a, yep. at a field territory. That was all on my comfort zone. But the more I did it, yeah, the more I failed forward, the faster I learned, but also I learned how to build my confidence up in very quick ways because of that. Yeah. You know, what's interesting here. You talk about it. I feel like I fit that personality profile as well, because I know like, let's say it's a networking event or like a networking situation. I can only go in and be high energy for about 20 to 30 minutes. <laughs> and then I need to like walk away and recharge my battery. Oh, and that's, God. that's the same with anything. Like just, I, I feel that as well. So I know where that comes from. I also can, as you speak through it, can draw the parallels between magic and sales because who you are today, <laughs> I think very much reflects the fact that you persisted, you kept practicing in magic, you know, when you're practicing magic tricks, you really opening up the opportunity for failure. Like if you fail a trick in front of your friends, mm -hmm. right, that's not a great look. So practice over time really builds that muscle. And, and that's very impressive, Marcus. So um, thank you that. for sharing that. But I know that your first sales job wasn't necessarily the best thing. Your first job, you were super gung-ho right out of the gate, you know, making more calls, sending more emails and working harder than anyone else in the company, but you weren't able to attain the success that your peers were getting at that time. From what I understand, your boss's advice was to make more calls, <laughs> send more emails and work harder. What's wrong with that advice? And what advice would you give that younger Marcus instead, knowing what you know now? Yeah, so it's interesting because I think I grew up with Chinese immigrants as parents. So we grew up like, hey, just work hard. When you work really hard, you'll be really successful in anything in life. Yeah. So me going to B2B sales and me hearing that advice, especially when I was struggling, say, hey, just got to work really, really hard and you'll be successful. What you don't really realize, especially early on, is the truth is there's a lot of people that work really hard, but a lot of them don't have very good lives. In fact, they have very crappy lives. But I didn't realize at the time. So when I started struggling and my boss said, hey, well, what you got to do is just keep working harder. The truth is simple this. When you think about even from a peer conversion rate you know, standpoint, if you have, it's called a, I don't know, a 5% open rate in email, by working harder and sending more emails, you still have a 5% open rate. Okay. So like, why do you want to scale something that doesn't work? You know, if I, I, I remember, I'll give you examples. So I remember first two days uh, on my job, in my B2B sales job, I walked into by foot over 120 businesses by foot. All right. So this wow. walk in field, like this is like, I'm, I'm cold calling this business face to face. I'm trying to either close a deal uh, or book a meeting, et cetera. It's completely cold. I just went up and down the street. That's all I did basically. Mm -hmm. 120 businesses. I booked zero meetings. I closed zero deals. By pure math, that meant I had a 0% closing ratio, right? Or less than a 1% closing ratio or booking ratio of around 120 contacts. Yeah. The next day, I called every single one of those businesses, every card, I, every business card, I called every single one. Yeah. Multiple times. So at this point, out of all these people I've called, I had done easily 300, 400 plus touch points. Mm -hmm. Not a single meeting booked, not a single closed deal. So, even the, the, the idea of just work hard, send more emails. If I was to work harder, it's converting at zero. Why would I want to scale somebody converts at zero? <laughs> yeah. That just makes zero sense. Right. right? Zero and times also, zero is still a zero. Yeah, zero times yeah. one is zero. <laughs> so that was, that was first of all, like, this doesn't make any sense. I'm like, how can I remember at the end of the week? I'm like, how can this be possible? How can I literally have like, I was called even a less than a 1%, even if someone books on a Monday, on Monday, if I call again, yeah. even having a less than a 1%, how's that possible? Yeah. And on top of that, I wasn't stupid. I saw my peers who definitely were not working that hard. Okay. Book more meetings and close deals. And I'm like, I'm working way harder than that person. Right. And, and the truth is we, we look at every organization this is why when you look at the top like 5%, the top one percentile, very rarely are they consistently doing more activity than anybody else. Yeah. 
usually they actually do less activity. They're just working on the right things. And that's when I really realized, you know, it took me a while, some several weeks to, to realize that I was focused on the wrong things. And when you, when you actually work on the right things, that's when you actually move the needle. So the way I really think about it, it's kind of like working out. I can go and I can curl one pound a thousand times. That's only going to do so much, you know, build so much muscle on my arm. Okay. <laughs> like versus if I did 60 times at a way heavier weight. <laughs> yeah. Right. So when you think about this, like it doesn't make sense a lot of times to just put work hard. Now, once you know you have a, at least a relatively decent conversion ratio at whatever you're working at, then it makes more sense to start adding a little more quantity to it where you're still able to maintain the quality. But obviously, as you increase in quantity, your quality can go down a little bit. So it's finding a really good balance. Mm -hmm. That's why when you look at, say, someone who's an enterprise sales professional, mm -hmm. I mean, they're not sending out hundreds of emails a day, very rarely, right? They're not making hundreds of calls a day. Like, they're lucky to send like five emails a day, yeah. right? It's because they're very strategic. They know every single touch point matters. They're hunting with a sniper rifle versus a shotgun. Yeah, I agree with you. I think what I experienced in, in my roles as an SDR, BDR, and as an AE now is that quantity leads to quality. Because if I throw out a bunch of feelers, I can then understand what the conversion rate is on subject line A versus subject line B. Now I know that subject line A works, I can go and scale that up and use that to, you know, up my conversions. So, you know, whenever I got into a new role, my goal was just to jump on the phone with as many customers as possible so they can, I can learn to speak their language. I can learn to understand what do their problems sound like? You know, what are they thinking? What are their pri key strategic priorities? And that then helps me, you know, sort of create a plan of attack and create, you know, this ideal customer profile to go after and hopefully, you know, succeed in the long run. So I certainly agree with that, you know, quality and quantity over time sort of uh, approach to it. If you were to then give advice to younger Marcus, what would you ask him or tell him to focus on? Yeah, great question. So it's interesting because for a while I was doing exactly what you were doing, Tanbir. Like it was like, well, I'm just going to work my tail off. Um, so the quality is massive and it's huge. And you don't, you definitely need repetition to a certain extent mm -hmm. and kind of A, B test my way to success, right? It's kind of like, I didn't think about it as succinct as that, but that was basically what I did. If I could go back in time, what I would do is number one, I'd stop listening to people that were not able to have success. Yeah. So that was a mistake I made. I was listening to everyone. Like I was listening to the guy who had all his inbound leads come in. And I tear just happened to get like no inbound leads. I'm like, he's like, oh no, you just you just gotta do it like this. I'm like, but do you get like inbound leads? Of course, of course. An inbound lead is so different than a cold outbound prospect. Yeah. So number one, don't take advice from people that have not achieved what you want to achieve consistently. Okay. Number two, do the opposite. Go find the people who have already achieved it consistently and learn what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a really simple example. So one of the things I figured out weeks later, I'm like. How's this person in Seattle, like in this recession, like she's able to like have a, a, a better connect rate and booking ratio on her phones. Like, how's she doing it? And to me, I'm like, I was just like, I feel like I'm working really hard. I'm making a lot of calls, doing you know, all these things. So I called her up and the advice she gave me was like, it was, it was like stupid, simple, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of funny. It's kind of like when it's simple to do, it's just a simple to not do. Yeah. And uh, in the business I was in, we were in like box truck uh, and pickup truck like, rentals and leases. Okay. And she said, well, it's really easy. So she's like, I only go after people that already have a need. I'm like, what? She was like, I go after people. Like I, I drive around. This is what it's all kind of old. I, I, drive, I drive around. I see because our competitors have this yellow truck. I write down the name of the business. I have a list of those names and I'd work on those lists, on that list. I'm like, huh. She's like, they already have a need. I think you show them that we're the best. And that was like, just a, such a small, like so, so simple and of a shit. I'm like, huh, hmm. they already have a need. So I just need to show them what they were the best. But on top of that, the other, other little, little secret there really was she had a very clear ICP in place. Yeah. You know, I didn't have one. I literally was no joke, literally walking down the street, hitting every single business up, playing the numbers game. Yeah. Right. The list I had was just a Google list of businesses and the zip code. So I had was not clear in ICP. I did not know any of those things. Yeah. Um, it's only because talking to someone else, I was able to cut down my time drastically. So I, I share that because I find a lot of times we try so hard to recreate the wheel. 
especially mm-hmm. when we, we started to new role, new territory. And that's what I try to do. Um, now, granted, we were a startup and so in, in the area, there was no one really benchmark with, but the company, they had other, they had other like locations that had been thriving already. So it's finding those people that have already done it really, really well consistently mm-hmm. and seeing what they're doing. Right. And it's breaking down nitty gritty from, it could be anything from how they structure their emails, how do they write their emails, how they prepare for the day. What do they, if they, if they had, if I had to follow them around with the camera from eight to 5 PM, Monday through Friday, what are the exact things they would do? Monday through Friday. More importantly, what would they do differently if they were to restart the role over? Because after a while, you know, someone who's been in a territory for say 12 months versus someone who's brand new, their routine does shift a little bit. It's different. They just yeah. have more pipeline, et cetera. So what would they do differently instead? And then I would do my best to imitate those things. So not just their behavior, their routines and everything else, but I want to imitate their mindset, behaviors, and everything else that they're doing that really helps them be successful uh, long-term wise as well. Yeah. And I've noticed that that to be a key to success in many, many fields, you know, whether, whether it's starting business, sports, even, you know, it doesn't matter what field you really go into. A lot of people who are successful aren't actually being original. They're mm-hmm. just copying what somebody else took it. and putting their own spin on it, adding their own personality to it. Some something different, tweaking it, adjusting it mm-hmm. for, for their own needs. But Really, you know, the formula has already been mapped out for sales, for marketing, for business, for, for anything, for leadership. You know, the, the formula has already been mapped out. You just got to talk to the people who have already done it. You know, when you enter a new role, like you talked about, you know, the best advice is to go and find the people who do the best at one particular thing. Like, let's say it's connects, like setting meetings or closing or whatever it is, you know, map out that process and then try to get a deeper understanding of it. But one thing that I know about you is that you had a belief in your head for years that would just drilled into your head by your parents. And, you know, I've heard this before as, you know, my South Asian community was impacted by 9-11. And one of the main pieces of advice that I heard was don't attract any attention. Don't yeah. get in, get in trouble. Don't do anything that will make noise. And mm-hmm. I was just told to be really good at studying. And I think you get this Marcus, like yeah. be a doctor, lawyer, engineer, mm-hmm. you know, something like that and, and get good grades you had that belief of, you know, don't attract any attention drilled into you for years until you managed to shake it off. Yeah. What sort of limiting beliefs such as that do you think hold back average performers from becoming superstars? And how did you yourself shake off that limiting belief? Yeah, it's really hard. Uh, you're, you're spot on. So, you know, growing up, it's like, you're, you're right. Don't attract attention. Don't don't bring to the surface any weaknesses you have, right? Uh, don't come off that you don't know what you're talking about, and that that helped me back for sure, especially early on, because you know I was kind of asking for help, but not really. So I'll, I'll give you an example. I remember being seven weeks in. At this point, seven weeks in, no one had closed a deal, or I hadn't closed a deal, but everyone else was closing deals in the same time frame. I'm like, what is wrong with me? I'm like second guessing myself. I'm like. Oh man, Tanbir, I should have been an accountant, a lawyer, a doctor, <laughs> an engineer. I should have been one of those things. What is wrong with me? Why did I go against the grain? And I'm just second guessing myself. Yeah. And I remember my boss pulled me on a Friday at 4 p.m., which is never a good sign. And he threatened me with a PIP, a performance improvement plan. And at that point, I just took it. I just like took, let, let him just kind of, you know, break me, whatever. And it was like, all right, this is my fate. I got to do something about this. In hindsight, I, I do wish, like, I'm like, not necessarily push back. But like, did I really show enough vulnerability? Did I really say, hey, boss, listen, like early, I shouldn't early up before I got to that point. Like, I'm really struggling. Hmm. Like, I, I have literally just let's kind of map this out together. Like, I've even week one, I've you know done 120 plus cold calls. I've done this, this many like door knocks. No one's said yes to me. What am I doing wrong? Yeah. Would it, would, that, would I have got more coaching then? Maybe. Don't know. Right. So I look back, I don't, I don't blame him. You know, I, I take ownership in that, but those are some of the, the limiting beliefs where I'm like, I just need to figure it out. Yeah. I, I'm just going to take time to figure this out. Yeah. And, um, you know, I grew up really poor and we all, we've always had the mindset of we're just going to figure it out. We're just going to do whatever it takes. And, you know, it's, it's better like just to take our time and work our ass off and work hundreds of hours to figure it out. And I fell into that trap early on. And as I've gotten older, you know, one of the biggest, the mental shifts I had to break was my beliefs about time and money. Mm. And what I mean by that is before I'm like, time is money, time is money, time is money. This is what I believed. Now I'm in a stage in my life and it's, it's, it's for years now where I've realized time is greater than money. And I share specifically because I was in this mindset similar to you where like, I'm just going to work my ass off and figure it out. I'm just going to figure it out. 
And I'll give you an example. So when I started my business, I was struggling too. Like I was like, I was doing pretty well, but I was working, I was working 80, 90 hours a week. I try to figure it out on my own. Yeah. And I went probably six months. I was making good income, but not even close to what I was making for. I mean, I was making close to seven figures before my corporate job. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, for me to go my own business and be only be making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year for me, it was really disappointing. Like just, I was not pleased about that. And, but I was like, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to work hard and get myself back. You know, I was, was going to figure it out. Right. But I burned at least six months until I finally invested into a business mentor. And within three months, I'm like, like, we're like, I mean, we're, we're our, our results started to get, we started going, it started going insane because he helped me save all that time. And I look back and I'm like, time is greater than money because I spent all that time trying to figure it out. My opportunity costs was literally hundreds of thousands of dollars because if I got and helped earlier, I would have just, wait, I would have saved all this time. Right. I still need to put the work in, but at least I have clarity on what to do is actually going to move the needle. Cause the truth is, is like money is cool, but like whenever, if you ever run out of money, you will always get more money. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if you've been in a spot where you run, you spend all the money you have, but we always get more money. It always comes back. Mm -hmm. But time, once you spend it, you don't get it back. Yeah. So what I've realized over time is I might try to take the money I earn and buy back time. Yeah. But that's why I'll, for me, I've really realized this is a mental shift being like, you know, being like my parents are Chinese. They're very cheap. Like they don't want to spend any money. Like, like they're like, they're not about it. Right. Yeah. And for me, I've had to break those limits of saying, hey, you know what? I'm going to invest into things that are going to make me more money. I'm going to invest into say advertisements as they make me more money. It's going to save me time. I'm going to invest into people as I do it all myself. So that's the way my business can grow faster. I'm going to invest into coaching and mastermind so I can save myself the time and try to figure it out on my own. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's understanding that ultimately time is greater than money. Right. Because ultimately, all we really care about was what we do with and who we do it with. That was one of the beliefs I, I mentally had to really, really shift quite a bit because it's similar to you with, with that mindset we had before. If we don't shake it, then we get stuck with it. It actually ends up holding us back. And there's so many beliefs I grew up with from my parents that actually hurt me, even like just being really cheap with stuff. Like I was yeah. like, like, I used to buy the cheapest stuff possible. Yeah. And then it wore out. Then I buy, buy it new, but like, oh, it's the cheapest thing possible. And I, and I keep this a cycle versus spending a little bit more, get a little bit better quality, <laughs> and it lasts a lot longer and just works better. And you're happier too. So, those are probably some examples of the bullies I had to kind of shake and break over time. And there's things that I still work on as well still. Yeah. I grew up with that savers mentality as always, yeah. you know, penny pinching uh, as much as possible. But as I started getting older, as I got into sales, you know, my mindset started becoming instead of how do I save more money? The question became, how do I make more money? And that's what, that's what I love about sales because sales really gives you the opportunity to put in the work and get, get that return that get that output based on the work that you put in. But more on, again, on the money side, I did want to understand because I believe you, you have, you've had an incredible career, but you made enough money and you spent it and invested it wisely enough that you were able to start your business at 35 without necessarily worrying, you know, about having, not having income to fall back on. What money advice would you give to salespeople, you know, right now to make sure that they're not just you know, able to spend on the luxuries that they want in the present, but also yeah. set themselves up for the future. Yeah. So um, it's funny because sometimes people kind of see the life I have right now. And if they pay close attention, they're like, oh man, like I, I've seen your watch collection. That's a, <laughs> that's a pretty nice watch collection. Or, oh, you, you drive a Tesla. I've seen they give a nice house. I'm like, yeah, I didn't start this way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, like what I did was I invested the money first mm -hmm. and then gave myself freedom of choice. And what I would, and this stuff, I, I, I mean, one of the things I wish I learned more about early on is understanding tax law, mm -hmm. understanding tax law and how to reduce your taxable income, and maximize your income as well. One of the things that I did, and this really helped me over time, is just understanding some, uh, some, something as simple as called dollar cost averaging. And if you're not familiar with that, basically what that means is instead of trying to say time the market of saying, okay, I'm going to buy when it's low and sell when it's high and try to predict the market. First off, you're not going to be able to. Because it's impossible. And you're, if you have a full-time role, you don't have time to study all those things. But if you do what's called dollar cost averaging, meaning you invest the same amount every single month consistently, it'll even out your risk and the timing with your rate of return for the year. Mm -hmm. So this really helps us hedge your risk as well. Plus the S&P, 
is already doing better than most people's investments at eight to 10% growth anyways, even in the, in, the, in the worst years. So with that being said, one thing I did early on, and this really helped me, was I simply made sure I automated all my investing. So I did that first before I did anything else. Okay. So I'm going to say it again. I automated my investment. I did that first before I did anything else. Can you detail that? Like, how did you yes. set that up? So really simple. So first off, there's kind of obvious stuff. So most people have 401k. The truth is, is most people, like if you do it right, you could max it out, right? So I think right now it's like 20,500 is a max, mm -hmm. right? So if I knew early on that, that, that there was limits to it, I would have maxed it early on. I didn't. So I would max it out consistently every single month. You can automate that through your company. All right. Mm -hmm. Then you can do other things that are other tax vehicles in your country. So, for example, in the U.S., you have something what's called a Roth IRA. Yeah. The in the Canada, it's a TFSA because right. I'm, I'm in Canada. Yeah. Awesome. Beautiful. And what's cool about that is when you retire, you can pull it out and you don't get taxed. I don't know if it's the same in Canada, but it's a beautiful thing. Okay. So, so understanding what what type of vehicles are available is really, really good. And you start dumping money into those consistently, in addition to everything else. Right. So for example, like if you're into say cryptocurrency, right. Or anything else, I, I personally, no, I don't know enough about it. Right. But set money aside every month where you're automatically investing into it, mm -hmm. hedge your bets. Right. Mm -hmm. And you do as, as many buckets as possible. Now you can definitely go into like real estate and other things as well and get more complex. But for me, I wanted simple. Yeah. So literally I would literally invest no joke about 50% of my, all my income automatically. Yeah. Every month without, without fail. Right. I bought a property as soon as I could. You don't have to. I bought, I bought my first house when I was 25 because I, I wanted the equity. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and then you can start, you just, you just make, you just make everything automatic. Keep it really simple. Mm -hmm. Like if you take anything from this, it's not about what things to invest into because it, it varies. And I'm no, I'm not, a, I'm not a financial strategist or anything, but just choose certain buckets and start whatever you feel comfortable with. Start investing towards those dump as much money as possible consistently. So not as in like once a year, I'm going to dump money in. It's not, mm -hmm. I got a big commission check. I'm, I'm going to finally invest. Yeah. Make it a pattern. Make it a habit where every time you get the cash, the first thing is you invest it. Yeah. You automatically by just having it set up or you manually do it. Yeah. This, just by doing this, you already had of like 95% of people out there. And like this will just by itself is so key. In addition to that, invest in things that will really compound you exponentially. And one of the things I did early, and I want, I want you to do more of this, was I invested into my own skills, all right? So picture where you want to be five to 10 years down the road. What skills do you need to develop now to get to where you want to go, all right? And that could be, and I'm not just saying invest into like, you know, coaches, I'm, I'm not saying that. It's like, whatever. what is it going to be? So I'll give you a real good example. So uh, I remember it was 2009 or 10. And I felt at the company I was at, I invested a good amount of time there and I was at a point where I was, oh, was kind of hitting a peak and I felt like I'm a big fish in the pond and I didn't know if I could really upscale my skills, which I knew would limit me income wise, life wise, et cetera. I started looking at other companies and at this point I've been asking me like five years. I'm like, I'm going to make a shift to yeah. the company, but I wanted to be in a educated investment, if you will, because I'm going to, to me, it's a time investment now. Right. So I made the switch to new company, which I knew would challenge me, would be a different industry, different, different like ladder climb. I had to restart, restart over because nobody went my background. And then I invested more time in this new company. And because of that, I was able to skyrocket pretty quickly, earn even more money and get in higher level roles. And that really skyrocketed my career and put me as, to position to be able to say, I'm done. I'm good. Yeah. And that was very strategic. So I didn't necessarily chase the money there. I was chasing the skill development that I knew. Right. Because now it's like, you know, I knew like, I'm like, if I want everyone to do my own business or anything else, I need to be really good at leadership. I need to be able to manage multiple tiers. If I work with businesses down the road, I need to be able to be in a spot where I can really understand big enterprise opportunities. Mm -hmm. So all those things was an investment in my own time now. Right. And it gave me skills to do it. So it's really thinking to yourself, if I want to get in a spot where I can retire or do whatever I want in five, 10, two years, whatever it's going to be, what skills do I need to get right now? Where can I get those skills? How can I invest into those skills? And then take the cash you have and use it to invest because now you're buying time. You're saving yourself the time to get there. And the mistake many people make is they say, well, Marcus, I'm just going to YouTube it. You can, but if it was that easy to YouTube it, then everyone will be a, a millionaire with a six pack. 
yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I find the, the, the trickiest part about that is because as soon as you start going down that rabbit hole, like let's say YouTube, for example, there's so many gurus, right? There's oh, yeah. so much information and all of them conflict and clash. So this goes back to what you said earlier at the beginning of the call, which is don't take advice from people that haven't done it before, number one. And then when you're taking advice from somebody, just only take their advice and then implement it and then and then see the progress because I forget what the exact saying is, but you know, if you chase two rabbits, you're not going to catch any either of that's them. Right. You know, so, so that's that you know really falls in line to to what you're saying here. So that's really great advice for for money management uh, and just career management, to be frank. But if there were three things, if someone wanted to crush their year, hit their targets, and put themselves at the top of the line for that next promo, what are the three things they should be implementing today to get there? Sure. I think number one, get crystal clear on exactly what those goals are. Like it can't be like, I was going to crush my number. I want to get promoted. Like you want to break it down to exactly what number do you want to be at? Mm. Like let's say, for example, let's just say your quota is 500K and you want to do, you know, 200% to your number. So you have to do 1 million. So now, you know, it's crystal clear exactly what it's going to be. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So number one, know exactly what, what, what those goals are. This could be for professional to your sales goals, whatever it's going to be. Number two, reverse engineer it. Everything is reverse engineered down. Like building buffers. So for example, if, if you need to close a million dollars in business and building a buffer, how many discovery calls do you need to run on a monthly basis on this discovery calls based on the conversion ratios you have? All right. Mm. How, how many pieces of outreach do you need to do now to get to that point? This is where you have to understand the conversion the numbers you're at to be able to have an idea versus, well, I'm just going to work really hard and get there. You know, I think I should probably do whatever. Like, for example, I know in order to hit the big income, income goals that we want from our team here, we need to book at minimum seven calls a day. Minimum. Mm -hmm. My team has to do that. If they do not do that, we're behind pace. Mm -hmm. I broke it down. And that's from the whole, whole year. I broke it down. If every day we do this, we'll get there. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's literally that granular to that point. And there's even a buffer built in there. So the days we don't hit it, the days we really crush it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Because consistently we built enough buffer to far exceed it. All right. So yeah. reverse calculate everything. This would be from you want to get promoted. What exactly do you need to do to get there? Like if you were to ask the entire hiring chain, Mm -hmm. Let's just say, for example, if you, there's also a VP, a director, and a sales manager between you and to get to where you want to go, what would they tell you? What would okay. be the exact things you need to do and show up as to do it? All right. And only when you really know that, then you can you actually do it. And then number three, this is going to be, this kind of ties it all, all together, right? Take all those things and break it into daily tangible bite-sized piece that you can truly execute as part of your routine. Mm -hmm. So it's not one big thing you have to do, but what are the specific daily things you need to do to get to where you want to go? Make it as simple as possible, right? And I, I'm overgeneralizing here because sometimes obviously they're weekly, et cetera, but let me give you an example. So let's just say, for example, if your leader says, hey, you know, Tanvir, if you want to become a sales leader, I want to see you influence the team more and help them become better. Well, instead of just saying, okay, well, you know what? At their next sales meeting, I'm just going to do this and that's it. You might be like, all right, cool. I'm going to kind of break this down. How can I break this down to something daily and tangible? All right. Every single day, I'm going to reach out to one person on my team is check in, just via Slack, see how everything is going. I'm a team, my team of six, just see how they're going. All right. Yeah. Once a week, I'm going to huddle like one or two and just role play with them in their role to help them become better. And once a week, I'm going to update my leader on how they're doing. So now you actually have tactical things you're actually doing. They're actually going to move the needle towards helping you get promoted. And when you start thinking this way, then you're more likely to actually get it done. So really when it breaks down to, it's like you have complete clarity to vision of the, of the big level stuff, but you also know what do you need to do daily to actually get there? Yeah. Oh, those are great. So number one, get crystal clear on your goals. Number two, reverse engineer uh, and go backwards with what you need to do to get to those goals. And then reverse engineer even further to turn those into daily habits that you just mm -hmm. naturally do as a part of your daily routine. That's, that's, right. that's amazing. And speaking of routines, Marcus, 
you have one of the craziest morning <laughs> routines I think I've ever seen in my entire life. So I'm going to read this out. Um, okay. it, it's not so you wake up at 515, you brush your teeth, uh, you power, you do a power 30 minute workout targeting a specific muscle group. You go to your home office, you do Wim Hof breathing. Then you write down a one, your one, three and five year goals every day. You write them down, you journal them, you do your affirmations. You then highlight your perfect day one year from today. So you look at yourself, you're saying, all right, one year from today, what does my perfect day look like? You're sort of you know, narrating that story in your head. Then you visualize your upcoming day and how you expect it to go, you know, exactly like a play by play. Then you do your social media posts, engage with those posts while you're doing that. You're also walking on a treadmill with a weighted vest. Oh yeah. So good, my, good my, prep work. Nice work. I like thank, it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So my first question is why? Yeah. And my second question is just like, how did you come up with that? How did you formulate that? And how can somebody else maybe, you know, find their perfect morning, morning routine? Awesome. So I think the first piece is understand this. That works for me, not for everyone. Yeah. All right. And it's important to understand that everyone needs to have their version of it. So my very first morning routine was about 12 seconds long. All right. Today, it's an hour and a half. You have to find something that's going to work for you. And what I've really uncovered over time is we really have four energy buckets. And if you want to be a peak performer in anything in life, you have to manage your buckets, all right, which is your emotional, mental, spiritual, and physical buckets. And each person has a different size bucket for each one, so it requires different things. So once you kind of realize what those are, then you want to do consistent things daily to set you up for success. And what I have found, you can't control how the day, how the day goes, but you can control how you react to the day. And the more energy you have, the more effective you are in controlling yourself when whatever happens, happens. Whether you lose a deal, get chewed up by someone, or whatever happens, right? So understand that. So it really came about first when, you know, it was, I was brand new to sales and I was struggling. I mean, I was, I remember like waking up and just dreading going to work. Like I was like dreading going to work, dreading making calls. It, it, it rains a lot in Oregon. I'm like, I'm, it's pouring out rain. I don't want to go to the office. I don't want to like go knock on doors. I don't get my, my cheap suit, like, you know, all drenched. I, I don't like, why are people mean? And it was, it, was, it was very reactive. And my before my morning routine was like this. I wake up, I brush my teeth, put my suit on, and just drive to the office. That was it. I always feel like I was always like behind, if you will. I get there, I'm like rushed, you know, like I'm not mentally ready, et cetera. And then I came across a book by Tony Robbins called Awaken the Giant Within. And one of the things he talks about that he's big on morning routines and he talks about affirmations. That was the first thing that he said is you got, you got to do affirmations. I'm like, that sounds kind of stupid. <laughs> like, like I, I'm not going to say like, you know, uh, you know, I feel great. I'm the best. You know, if it is to be, it's up to me. I'm not sounds stupid. I'm not going to do that. And then I was like, what do I have to lose? Like, I'm like, I'm, I'm already feeling terrible. Right. So I remember like, in my car, I remember pulled up in my 2001 Honda Accord on 17 inch rims, pulled up to the office, I'm parked outside, and I just did some of his affirmations. Like, I was like, I was like you know, you, you want to make sure your body's in sync. And this is the best my possible bill. I can't even remember what, which one it was. I think it was something like, if it is a B, it's up to me. I did like three times. I, I smiled real big, threw my shoulders back. I did like three times in a row. And uh, I, I, I look in the mirror. I remember the mirror's down, like my, my visor is down, look in the visor. And I just started laughing. I'm like, this is like so stupid. <laughs> but I felt good. Yeah. I'm like, all right. I, 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 I'm, I'm like walking, kind of laughing now. I'm like, I'm like walking my, into the office like, with my team. I'm like, hmm. So I started doing it every day. And then over time, I started learning different techniques. I'm like, what, would, what else would make me feel good? Mm. What else would make me feel good? What else would really make me feel just on my game? You know, I'm like, well, you know, like, and I'll read other books and I'll, and I'll get inspired. Like, oh, you know, Brian Tracy says to write your goals out daily. Okay, well, I'm not hitting my goals right now. Might as well. <laughs> so I would start writing my goals daily. Mm -hmm. And it felt really good. It felt really good to have clarity to it. Because uh, we shared just our morning routine. I have an evening routine as well. So I started incorporating these things in my evening routine as well. I'm like, wow, this feels, it feels really good to have clarity in my goal. Right? To, uh, I, and, over, and over time, I would add different elements from visualization. So even when I visualize my, my day, it's actually a recording of myself. Like I've recorded myself verbalizing my perfect day one year from today, assuming I've hit every single one of my goals and I've narrated it out onto my phone and I listen to it and I visualize every single morning. 
Wow. And I would start inserting these things as I would pick it up around the people and it made me feel really good. Right. And I just felt like, well, I felt better. I'm like, dude, I just performed better. So you start realizing pretty quickly. It's about state management. Like your ability to manage your state determines the, the results you achieve in that day. Because again, like think about if you, uh, I, I've seen all the time, if, if, if you're on a sales call and even if you're like getting beaten up, but you have, you're like, you're, you're positive, you're upbeat, you control your state, that call goes so much better. It goes so much further than if you were just like, oh, you're right, Mr. Prospect, you're getting beaten up. But you can't do that without consistently do it over time. Right. And what's, what's, what's really wild is um, now this is a point where my routine is pretty long and I'll still add things to it. Like when I, when I find things I really appreciate, I'll add it in to make it better. So I'll give you an example. So this is uh, 2018. And, um, you know, we just had another banner year. I'm a director, big team, et cetera. And I remember I went through like a really dark period. Like it was a, it was a really dark period. Uh, I had one of my leaders that, you know, unfortunately, like he passed away. He passed away, was dealing with some drinking issues, his liver, a young guy, liver failed. And that was dark. I mean, that was like this guy, I'm like, I was like, wow, we built something amazing in this location. He, he worked for me, like, and he just, he just died. And I remember like, that was just, that was so tough. And it was like winter time. And we had like a lull that month as well. Like my, my, all my teams weren't doing well. I mean, we were all impacted by this. This is like really heavy stuff. I'm like, oh man, like, you know, and I'll, I remember thinking to myself like, can I even do this anymore? Like, do I still want to do this? Like, this is hard. This is hard being a leader of a big organization and deal with something that's like, it's one thing to have people miss their number and whatever, but it's nothing to have someone pass away. Not that I obviously have anything to do with it, but still it's heavy. It's really heavy. I remember at that time, and I had heard about this, like this one simple technique to kind of bring your head back into space called, you know, having a gratitude journal. Many people do it. I never, never really done it at that time. I've done everything else you've heard so far. So I started doing that. I remember it was like December, 2017 or maybe 2018. And uh, I started um, doing a gratitude journal every single day. And it was amazing where, yes, I still felt pretty, pretty awful at the time because it was really dark, but I was able to at least pause each day and reflect and, be, and realize, you know what? I'm really lucky still. And, you know, you know, this is good. This is good. This is good. This is good. I write it all down. So I share that with you where, um, you know, the, the morning routine is organic. It changes over time. And for people out there who are looking to create their own routine, you do not need to do like me. You do not need to do like Tanvir, but what you got to do is find what's your stuff you want to do. What are the couple of things you want to do that fills the four buckets I mentioned that are going to fill you up and give you energy. That could be as simple as daily prayer. It could be as simple as a daily walk. It could be time with your family. It, there's no wrong answer. The only wrong answer is if you don't have a routine. If you don't have a routine, then you become reactive. And when you become proactive, this is actually how you start separating from the pack. And when you realize this and you start becoming proactive, you start preparing for things like this, you realize the separation is in the preparation. So that's why I'm big on morning routine because, again, we can't control the end result, but we can control how we show up for ourselves, for our prospects, and for our family. You're the perfect example of hearing something like hearing an idea and then instead of being a naysayer implementing it and then allowing yourself to experience great results or maybe results that don't work for you and that's, that's not right. part of your routine you know a lot of people might hear something like affirmations or a gratitude journal and they'll say no i'm not gonna try that it doesn't work for me without actually having tried it and seeing if it works for them you know and right. the other thing i would add on top of that is that you've you've built this morning routine over years and years of adding and subtracting i'm sure oh, but yeah. for the people listening you know you, you only really need to pick one thing to start off from i've i've started a daily meditation practice and it's you know it's changed so much about how i lead into the day and, and carry myself throughout the rest of my day i love it man i'll give you an example so one thing i, I just added is into my weekly routine which i absolutely love is so my wife works from home so every Friday now at 10 a.m., we go on a walk, just me and her. No kids, nothing else, no calls, just me and her. It's amazing. It's just, it's great for our relationships, great for our health. It's one of the things where like, you know, it's like you make time for your spouse. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. We'll do, I'll do it. Like, oh, yeah. But the truth is, is like sometimes the simplest answers are the answer we most need to make the shift we need in our lives. That is awesome. And it makes me think about, you know, sort of a, a key tenant that I think about is that if it's actually a priority, you have to schedule it in your calendar. Like it's got to be, it's got to be scheduled because then 
you've visualized the priorities that you say that you verbalized or thought of and now you're you have an accountability buddy let's call it in a calendar to, that's right. to work against that's right yeah that's right yeah exactly marcus this was this was awesome um got a number of, of gems throughout the whole episode where can people find you learn more about you interact with you uh, and connect with you going forward awesome man so uh i'm most most active on linkedin so you can look at marcus chan should be the only guy with speedos in the in the body of the, of the messaging as well. Uh, you can also head over to my website, which is uh, sixfiguresalesacademy.com. Sixfiguresalesacademy.com. You access a bunch of free trains in there. And also, you can reach out to me on there as well. Marcus, this was awesome. What would be one last final piece of advice you would give to my listeners to help them achieve their next big win? Mm, for your next big win. Okay, I'll give you one really super tactical, super simple one. All right. Before you wrap up any sales call you have map out together exactly what is going to happen when you when you guys leave the call you and the prospect meaning if they had to write out on a google doc i'm gonna first do one two three four five six seven what exactly would they tell you okay and you go through that right and map it out together so it might sound something like this hey mr and mrs prospect you know Assuming you love everything we discussed today, what would happen next? What does that look like exactly? Oh, I need to get my boss involved. Cool. What's that look like specifically? Well, we usually huddle every single week. Awesome. When's that meeting usually? <laughs> it's every Tuesday. Great. Tuesday, what time? Tuesday is at 8 a.m. Cool. So, and 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 when you when you bring someone forward like this, how does it usually go? All right. Can I get my point here? So we get we get so granular. So it makes them stop and pause and basically map out with you what happens next. So then this way, when you actually build out your mutual action plan together, you're actually fulfilling the things they're going to do to get you to where you want to go versus an arbitrary plan. When you have specifics to it, it holds them accountable to it, increases the likelihood of them actually executing on it. So you can actually move the deal forward to a close. Super tactical, super actionable. Marcus, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on Winnie Streets. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much. 